Welcome to Ruth Got Truth. We're going to look at chapter two today. I'm ready to dive in. Are you? It's a great story. Let's read. Now there was a wealthy and influential man in Bethlehem named Boaz, who was a relative of Naomi's husband, Elimelech. One day, Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, let me go out into the harvest fields to pick up the stalks of grains left behind by anyone who is kind enough to let me do it. Naomi replied, all right, my daughter, go ahead. So Ruth went out to gather grain behind the harvesters. As it happened, she found herself working in a field that belonged to Boaz, the relative of her father-in-law, Elimelech. While she was there, Boaz arrived from Bethlehem and greeted the harvesters. The Lord be with you, he said. The Lord bless you, the harvesters replied. Then Boaz asked his foreman, who is that young woman over there? Who does she belong to? And the foreman replied, she is the young woman from Moab who came back with Naomi. She asked me this morning if she could gather grain behind the harvesters. She has been hard at work ever since, except for a few minutes rest in the shelter. Boaz went over and said to Ruth, Listen, my daughter, stay right here with us when you gather grain. Don't go to any other fields. Stay right behind the young women working in my field. See which part of the field they are harvesting and then follow them. I have warned the young men not to treat you roughly. And when you are thirsty, help yourself to the water they have drawn from the well. Ruth fell at his feet and thanked him warmly. What have I done to deserve such kindness, she asked. I'm only a foreigner. Yes, I know, Boaz replied, but I also know about everything that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband. I have heard how you left your father and mother and your own land to live among complete strangers. May the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge, reward you fully for what you have done. I hope I continue to please you, sir, she replied. You have comforted me by speaking so kindly to me, even though I am not one of your workers. At mealtime, Boaz called to her, Come over here and help yourself to some food. You can dip your bread in the sour wine. So she sat with his harvesters, and Boaz gave her some roasted grain to eat. She ate all she wanted and still had some left over. When Ruth went back to work again, Boaz ordered his young man, Let her gather grain right among the sheaves without stopping her, and pull out some heads of barley from the bundles and drop them on purpose for her. Let her pick them up and don't give her a hard time. So Ruth gathered barley there all day, and when she beat out the grain that evening, it filled an entire basket. She carried it back into town and showed it to her mother-in-law. Ruth also gave her the roasted grain that was left over from her meal. Where did you gather all this grain today? Naomi asked. Where did you work? May the Lord bless the one who helped you. So Ruth told her mother about the man in whose field she had worked. She said, the man I worked with today is named Boaz. May the Lord bless him, Naomi told her daughter-in-law. He is showing his kindness to us as well as to your dead husband. That man is one of our closest relatives, one of our family redeemers. Then Ruth said, what's more, Boaz even told me to come back and stay with his harvesters until the entire harvest is completed. Good, Naomi exclaimed. Do as he said, my daughter. Stay with his young women right through the whole harvest. You might be harassed in other fields, but you'll be safe with him. So Ruth worked alongside the women in Boaz's field and gathered grain with them until the end of the barley harvest. Then she continued working with them through the wheat harvest in early summer. And all the while, she lived with her mother-in-law. So guys, there's a lot to dive into here, but let's just take a look again at what predicament we find these two women in. Remember, we have two women who are widows without the protection of males at this time a time of patriarchal abuse, right? This is the period of the judges. Dun, dun, dun. Really dark times. For these two women to be protected by their society, it must be something particular at work. Did you guys catch this little word at the beginning of this passage? As it happened, right? And in the Hebrew, uh, it's a really interesting construction. It's like a verbal form followed by a noun that's very closely related to the, the verbal form. So it, it feels something like she chanced a chance. <laughs> and uh, is this really chance? Is this happenstance? Is this as it happened? Well, sometimes, guys, if we look close enough, God is providential. And what I mean by that is that the circumstances in your lives are as such that God is orchestrating something that if we were just attentive to it, perhaps we would see his presence in our everyday lives.
what happens and what unfolds is given under the context of God's law. Maybe you're wondering, where is God, right? I know things are going well for them, but is this God's doing? Is God really here or is this just good fortune? Well, let's try to conflate those two things a bit as we look at God's presence in the law. Maybe it would be expected to find some care for Naomi because she's part of this tribe. But but Ruth, remember God's law. He gave them this way of living. He, he drew his people out of slavery in Egypt, and he gave them a way of life, a covenant law that they would carry out. It's a picture of a better society that God is planting his people in the middle of this wonderful land in Israel, and he's letting them represent him. They're a kingdom of priests, a royal nation. And they're supposed to represent God to the world. So whatever law they have was an extension of God's interests and the way that he viewed humanity. So would God's law address the outsider? Would God's law address people like Ruth? As a matter of fact, it does. Let's take a look at your favorite biblical genre, the law. We're going to look at how God's people were supposed to treat the alien. Another way of saying that in common usage is refugees. Ruth here in this patch just called herself a foreigner. She uses the word nokria, which is slightly different than the word I'm going to be unpacking called ger. But digging around in some biblical dictionary stuff, apparently these words are intimately connected. So at any rate, she's identifying herself as a foreigner. And she, as you can see in her response to Boaz, why would you treat me this way? I'm just a foreigner. There is an expectation that she might be mistreated, but not in God's law. Part of my hope is not simply to study with you, but to actually demonstrate how to study. So one of the best resources you can use if you're interested in a particular topic is a Bible dictionary. So let's study together. This is from an excellent resource, the Dictionary of the Old Testament Pentateuch. Here we go. The position of the alien in ancient Near Eastern society was generally one of dependence with a certain amount of cultural isolation. The Pentateuchal Laws, that's the first five books of the Bible, regarding aliens demonstrate a clear humanitarian concern, including guarantees of an even-handed justice without prejudice to their status, fair payment of wages, gleaning rights to leftover harvest, other provision of food from the triennial tithe, and inclusion and feasts alongside the orphan and widow and inclusion in the Sabbath rest. The call to treat the alien with justice and special consideration was motivated by Israelite identification with the vulnerable position of the alien, which had been such a formative part of their own experience. So the aliens among Israel would receive gleaning rights. That's what we see happening here in the story of Ruth. Gleaning. It left the food in the field for them and it dignified their labor. It wasn't simply handout, but it was a very thoughtful way to provide for those in need. Did you catch that? That Israel identified in part of their own story as alien. What would it mean that they are an alien? Let's take a look at that word ger in more detail. While the primary identity of the ger in Pentateuchal law is that of the non-Israelite foreigner, it is significant that the term is applied within the Pentateuch not just to people who are ethnically non-Israelite, but also to Israelites themselves when they find themselves in comparable socioeconomic situation of the temporary resident with no land and established family support network. Uh, you see this sentiment in Deuteronomy chapter 26, verse 5. My father was a wandering Aramean. He went down to Egypt and sojourned there. That's the verbal form of ger. All the patriarchs, guys, were gers. They all gared. Aren't you geared up for this conversation now? All right, let's take a deep breath before this next excerpt. <gasps> Along with other particularly vulnerable groups in Israelite society, such as the orphan and widow, who were also most likely to be landless and thus incapable of economic independence, the alien was afforded a number of special protections in Pentateuchal law. This demonstrates a clear humanitarian concern. The protected status also reflects the fact that these groups were especially vulnerable to injustice, easily taken advantage of for lack of anyone naturally obliged to stand up for them. Yahweh himself thus takes on the role of ensuring justice for them. Aliens were to be treated fairly and righteously against all temptations to take advantage of them. Out of consideration for their especially vulnerable economic position, that is, not having any inheritance or land of family ties to fall back on in times of crisis, aliens were given rights and privileges similar 
to or even exceeding those of the native Israelite. Pentateuchal law answered their precarious vulnerability to economic hardship with charitable provision of basic necessities like food for the alien, the gleanings of the harvest, and the leftover of fallen grapes were reserved for the poor and the aliens. See these Bible verses, the triennial tithe was available for aliens along with Levites, orphans, and widows. So if you just think about how many layers of vulnerability we're talking about here for someone like Ruth, we have a widow, we have a, a single woman, we have someone with no family ties and no land and no resources, who is a refugee, an ec ecological refugee, and a foreigner. This is the sense of someone who is vulnerable. And here we have in the law that God's people were supposed to treat people who were vulnerable with certain dignity and charity. So let's boil down the status of a gear. It was someone who was dependent on a patron for protection. Who would be the patron for this poor gear, this foreigner, Ruth? Who, who would be there for her? Deuteronomy 10, 18 through 19 then takes this concern to a f profound theological level by identifying Yahweh as one who loves aliens by giving them food and clothing. Indeed, since Yahweh himself loved aliens, the Israelites were also to love them, remembering that they had been aliens in the land of Egypt. This loving aliens becomes a type of ematio d, realizing our nature as being created in the image of a loving God. So who was going to be there? God was. And how was God going to show up? Through his people. This is God's presence mediated through the obedience to the law, living out in, in representation of God, his concerns for those in need. Remember this, how Jesus boils this down. Love God. What comes next, guys? Love others. Still not convinced this is important to God? Let me put a series of Bible verses here where God expressly connects this. And I'm gonna leave it here and you guys can pause it and check it out and dig around. So guys, when you're asking yourselves, where is God in the story of Ruth? Look here, the very framework that Boaz is like, hey, that person, they're from out of town. They probably need some food. Let me go get some. That was all set up by God. It's coming out of God's heart. This is a picture in the middle of a very, very rocky and challenging and largely disobedient period in Israel's history. There are people like Boaz who are following God's law. And look at the difference one person following God's heart for others makes in this person's life. The difference between survival and extinction. That's God's provision. So while the question seems a bit outdated for us, he says, whose woman is this? Or something to that effect. Uh, it's kind of this strange statement where he's like, does Ruth belong to someone? He is saying, this person doesn't have a patron. In, in a time like the period of the judges, you expect that person not to last very long for them to get taken advantage of. And here, Boaz is saying, you don't have a protector because God's heart for those in need, I'll protect you. I'll provide for you. In fact, you stay with my people and I will give a stern warning to the young men I employ not to harass you. This is a big deal. This is Boaz fully grasping and going even beyond what kind of covenant God pictures. It's someone who grasps the heart, the spirit of the law that he's caring for those in need. So how can this be theologically true that we can show up for one another as an embodying of the presence of God? Indeed, God invites us to bear his image. You know this from the beginning of the biblical narrative that our modus operandi, our highest point of fulfillment is that we get to represent God himself. Now, how does that work out in the life of of Ruth and in the life of Naomi. Well, let's take a look and maybe we can find something that we can learn and employ in our own lives as we attempt to represent God to one another. 
We see God in Boaz's covenant obedience and his obedience to the way God designed people to live, his obedience to the law. We see God in the mouth and in the heart boiling over in the speech of Boaz. He is blessing people. It is someone who devotes his life. He speaks of God as if God is there. He blesses those. The Lord bless you. The Lord bless you. And you see around him this culture of admiring God. He is making an impact. So we see it in the blessing speech that we see in numbers, that that we believe in God's blessing when we speak this over people we are inviting us to attend to God, for God to turn our face to Him and us direct our hearts to God. We see God at work in the effortful faith of Ruth. You know, she didn't just go out there and receive food. She had to work for it. So sometimes God gives us an opportunity. God gives us ways, people in your life. But have you talked to them if you're lonely? Uh, you actually have to actually pick up the phone or schedule a meeting, right? That there is some effort involved in your life. We see this in James. James speaks so well of this, that faith without works is dead. So if Ruth believed that God would would provide for her but sat on the ground and didn't do anything about it, how would God have given her the food she needed? So we see this participation, this effortful way of living that I'm going to just do the, you know, it's almost like the frozen thing. You do the next right thing. God has given you something to do. So you know part of what he wants for your life. So if you follow that Heart. See where that leads. Ruth knew she, as, as someone who cared for her aging mother-in-law, needed to provide, so she just found a field and started picking. She didn't know all this would happen, but she acted in faith, and she found this effortful faith that God would provide for her through her own hard work and a bit of providence. Somehow we are invited to represent God to one another, that this Imago Dei, this, that we are made in God's image. And one of the ways we can see God present in our lives is through each other. We saw that in Ruth's commitment to Naomi, that we were looking for the chesed, the character of God, this covenant love. And there it was in Ruth's commitment and love and covenant to Naomi. And here we are looking for God's provision. We need help. We need provision, we need resources, we need friendship, we need companionship, we need to know that our needs are going to be met by God in one of the places we can look as we look at the book of Ruth, as we can look to each other. Indeed, you are invited to represent God to one another. You can help your sibling in Christ see Jesus by your presence by your faith, by your love, by your character, by your obedience to God's way of life. Represent God to one another. Represent you. If you're looking for God in this season of life, perhaps, as it was for Ruth, God is right in front of you. Maybe God is in front of you in the presence of those who see and care for you, your parents, your friends, your youth group, your youth mentor. And so if you're looking for God and his provision, also know that you are tasked with representing God. And in this covenant we have with him, in this attempt at obedience of the Christian way of life, it's an effortful faith. It will require your attentiveness. It will require your work. But what other way to live than in partnership cooperatively representing and mediating the presence of God through our own lives. I hope this has been a blessing to you and continue to let this narrative work on your heart as you consider these things before God and as we talk about it with one another.